Okay, great. So this is joint work with Drew Fuderberg and Wayne Gao. Okay, and the question we confront is the following. So suppose you have a model you're interested in testing. You've gone out and collected data and you find that your model does a great job of predicting that data. Now that's suggestive that you've got a good model, but another possibility is that your model is simply so flexible, it actually would have fit essentially any data set quite well. At an extreme, it may not even be falsifiable. So it's important to separate these two possible explanations, uh, but to do that, we need to have some understanding of how restrictive your model actually is, which is often not apparent from the formal description of the model itself. So what we provide in this paper is a measure for the restrictiveness of economic models, which importantly is easily computed across a variety of applications. All right, so just to make this problem more concrete, let me actually tell you about the, uh, the example that led us to want to work on this project in the first place. Right, so here's a classic problem from economics. Consider a subject who's been offered a risky lottery. There's two possible prizes with corresponding probabilities. And we ask a subject, what is the dollar amount X such that you're indifferent between receiving the outcome of this risky lottery versus X dollars for sure? Okay, so that dollar amount X is known as the certainty equivalent of the lottery. Now there's many different models we could use for predicting that certainty equivalent. Uh, one quite famous one is the cumulative prospect theory model. Right, so uh, I won't go into too much detail about what the model is, but there's two parts to it. So one is a value function over money. And the second part is a probability distortion function. Okay, so the idea is that people don't in fact correctly assess probabilities. And one of the popular functional forms that's used when taking this model to data associates two free parameters with this part and two free parameters with this part. So now we can test this model uh, using actual data of certainty equivalents. Specifically, we use a data set from Bruhan et al, which includes 25 binary lotteries with 179 reported certainty equivalents for each lottery. So that's uh, certainty equivalents reported across different subjects. Okay, so our goal here is going to be, I tell you the, the lottery, can you predict the certainty equivalent uh, given by a specific subject? Now we can test this model by simply estimating these four free parameters on some subset of the data, okay, that's the training data, then taking that estimated model and using it to predict the remaining data, that's the test data, uh, and looking at how well the model does. And here specifically, we look at mean squared error. And now to understand the number that we get, we assess it relative to two benchmarks. So one benchmark is a naive baseline Okay, we can always simply predict the expected value of the lottery that actually corresponds to a degenerate case of CPT. Okay, at the other end, we actually know what the best possible error is in this problem. Okay, because there's only 25 lotteries and many reports per lottery, we can actually estimate the average certainty equivalent lottery by lottery. Okay, that's going to be the best possible prediction. It's still not going to give us an error of zero because of heterogeneity across the subjects. So that's predicting the average. All right, so here's the errors that we get from these two benchmarks. Here's the expected value error. Here's the best possible error. And this is what we find for CPT. So it turns out to be remarkably good, right? It almost achieves this best possible error. And there's two ways of interpreting that. So one way of interpreting that is that CPT is a fantastic model. It's really well describing the structure and perception of risk, right? So the, really there is that uh, S-shaped probability weighting distortion function. Another possibility uh, is that even though this model technically only has four free parameters, those four free parameters are actually sufficient to give this model enough expressiveness to actually mimic any relationship from binary lotteries into certainty equivalents. Okay, now, again, these are two very different explanations. And what we would like to do is to distinguish between when the model is indeed precisely tailored to capture real regularities versus when it's simply unrestricted. Right now, uh, we propose such a, uh, such a measure and at a high level, what we're gonna do is the following. We're gonna generate a bunch of synthetic data sets. We're going to look at how well the model performs on each of these synthetic data sets. Okay, understanding again that an unrestrictive model will perform well, not just on the real data, but also on the synthetic data. Then our measure of restrictiveness is, is roughly speaking going to be the average normalized error of the model across these synthetic data sets. And that's going to be normalized to range between zero and one. All right, so what I'm going to do now is describe the approach in a more general setting, and then I'm going to loop back to the motivating example and answer the question of how restrictive CPT actually is. All right, so here's our general setting. 
the analyst has access to feature vectors. In the previous example, this was simply the description of the binary lottery. There is some outcome that you want to predict. Okay, in the previous example, that was the reported certainty equivalent by a given subject. So a predictive rule or a predictive mapping then is going to be any mapping taking these feature vectors into predictions for this outcome. Okay, again, in the last example, that's going to be a mapping from the 25 unique lotteries into predicted certainty equivalents for each of those lotteries. Okay, now we're going to be interested in parametric economic models, uh, which consist of many different such mappings, okay, which are unified in the sense that they obey some common structure. Right. Now, just as in the previous example, we're also going to take as a benchmark a naive mapping, which is some sort of degenerate case of this economic model. Okay. Finally, uh, another primitive we're going to take is this function D, which tells us essentially how far apart any two mappings F and F prime are. So we say more in the paper about how exactly to choose D, but in the case of a loss function, which is mean squared error, a very natural choice and the one that we in fact use, uh, says that the distance between F and F prime is the expected quadratic distance between their predictions. All right, so now here's our approach. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to generate a bunch of hypothetical mappings F from a distribution mu over a set of permissible mappings. Okay, the way that we understand the set of permissible mappings uh, is as encoding any background constraints the analyst considers reasonable for the setting. Right? Some mappings are just ridiculous. We don't even have to consider them. And the way to understand our, model, uh, our measure is as telling you how many additional constraints the model imposes beyond the set of basic background constraints. Now, this distribution view, you can think of as the analyst's prior. In all of our applications, we simply take that to be a uniform distribution over this set of permissible mappings, okay, motivated by a sort of principle of indifference. Now, for each generated mapping F, we can now ask how well does the model actually approximate F? So here, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the minimal distance between the generated F and any F prime in this model class. Okay, we're further going to normalize that by dividing through by the distance between the generated F and the naive mapping. Okay, so the benefit of that is it's going to give us a unitless measure, which is going to be easier to interpret. Okay, then finally, our measure of restrictiveness is defined to be the expected normalized approximation error when, again, we draw these mappings f from the distribution mu. All right, so a few more comments on this measure. So first, it ranges from 0 to 1. Okay, larger values of r correspond to a more restrictive model. Uh, if r is equal to 0, that corresponds to a completely unrestrictive model, uh, for example, as would be achieved if your model class included every permissible mapping. Okay, we're going to complement evaluation of restrictiveness uh, with evaluation of the completeness of the model, which is defined to be one minus the model's normalized error to F star, where F star now is going to be the true mapping that you see in the data. So let me just emphasize that for calculating restrictiveness, you actually don't need any real data, right? This is all simulations. Okay, in contrast to evaluate completeness, we actually are going to need a real data set of actual uh, behaviors. Okay, so this coincides with a, a notion that was uh, proposed in a previous paper by uh, Drew uh, Funerberg, John Kleinberg, Senator Mullenith, and, uh, and myself. All right, so this measure of completeness also ranges from zero to one. Larger values implies that the model predicts real data better. And ideally, what we would really like is for the model to have high completeness, meaning it fits the real data well, but also high restrictiveness, meaning it fits, fits the synthetic data poorly. And we're going to evaluate models henceforth from this dual perspective of restrictiveness and completeness. Okay, so now just a brief comment on the uh, related literature. So there is a, a class paper by Koopmans and Rehearsal, which introduces this binary notion of essentially whether or not the model is actually falsifiable. Okay, here we ask not just is it falsifiable, but really how restrictive is it, right? How easily falsifiable is it? Uh, now, you can answer that question if you have a representation theorem. Uh, so this is the work of decision theory. Uh, unfortunately, however, we generally don't have representation theorems for most models uh, in economics. And especially, we generally don't have them for most functional forms that are actually used in applied work and taken to the data. 
Right. So our measure also relates to, but differs from a large literature on how to avoid overfitting. So you uh, might know of AIC, BIC, VC dimension, et cetera. So there's a real philosophical difference here between our approach and these, uh, these other prior approaches, okay, which is that the view motivating these previous measures has been that we want to penalize the complexity of the model in order to avoid overfitting to a data set that's too small. But actually, as your data size gets larger, in general, the penalty that you impose on the complexity of the model shrinks. Okay, if you had an infinite data set, you might even consider using a non-parametric model. Okay. Our perspective uh, differently is that even if you had an infinite data set, you might nevertheless prefer a more parsimonious model. Right? If you can achieve the same prediction error using two parameters versus 10 parameters, we prefer the one using two parameters. So you can actually think of our measure as applying in settings even with infinite data. Okay, so now back to the motivating example. So just to remind you, our data consists of this 25 binary lotteries uh, with many reported certainty equivalents per lottery. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna keep the lotteries as given in the data, but we're, we're gonna ignore the real certainty equivalents that were reported by the subjects. Okay, we're now gonna generate fake average certainty equivalents, one per lottery. Okay, so vectors like this. And we're gonna constrain those vectors to obey two basic properties. Uh, so first, we want it to be the case that if one lottery first order stochastically dominates another, then its average certainty equivalent should be higher. Okay, so this roughly tracks that people like money, right? Uh, additionally, we require that the certainty equivalents that we generate fall in the range of the possible prizes. And then subject to these constraints, we simply generate mappings uniformly at random. Can we look at how well the model does in, uh, in approximating these generated mappings? So this is what we, uh, oh, oh, okay, one more thing. So I told you about CPT. We're also going to consider a second model, which is disappointment aversion. Uh, so they're quite similar, in fact. The main difference is in the functional forms that they use for this probability of distortion component. Uh, one more thing that might be a little bit confusing, all of our lotteries are actually over positive prizes. So although I mentioned a moment ago, two parameters corresponding to this value function, effectively for us, it's going to be one. Okay, just uh, the single risk aversion parameter alpha, which appears in both models. Then there's two parameters in CPT for this part, a single parameter in disappointment aversion for this part. Okay, so now we can see how well these models actually do. All right, so here I've got completeness on the x-axis, restrictiveness on the y-axis. And here is where the two models fall. So the first thing we see is that although we already did know CPT is very complete, right? It's great at predicting the real data. Uh, part of the reason for that turns out to be that it's actually not very restrictive, right? So in fact, for many synthetic data sets, it would have predicted very well as well. Um, and this is particularly striking because again, the number of parameters is quite small, right? So this extreme flexibility of the model is not revealed by a simple count of the number of free parameters. The other thing that we see is that the disappointment aversion is more restrictive than CPT, uh, but substantially less complete. Okay, we can further uh, use these measures to better understand the value of the individual parameters in each of these models by looking at lower parameter specifications of each of these models. So for example, we can allow for probability weighting, but uh, suppose that the agent is risk neutral, or we might shut down probability weighting, but allow for risk aversion. Okay, and here's what we find. So these are the two original models. Now let's add in the two parameter specifications for CPT. So the models become weakly more restrictive, right? Because they have fewer free parameters, uh, but weakly less complete. And now let's add in the one parameter specifications. Again, a shift towards higher restrictiveness, lower completeness. And moreover, we can isolate the effect of specific parameters by looking at what happens when we toggle it on and off. So for example, here is disappointment aversion with just alpha, and here is disappointment aversion with alpha and eta. So what's happened when we added in this probability weighting parameter eta? Well, restrictiveness has dropped substantially, right? It's telling us that we're getting a lot of additional flexibility from this new parameter, but completeness has barely improved, right? So this is really not a very effective parameter. It's adding flexibility, but exactly not in the right direction. All right. Uh, Similar story for the parameter zeta, right? So again, adding zeta to CPT alpha, big drop in restrictiveness, minor improvement in completeness. If we start from alpha, gamma, add zeta, okay, very similar story. We're going from here to here. 
In contrast, if you consider the CPT parameter gamma, okay, adding in gamma, so let's start with CPT alpha, say, okay, we add in gamma, that gets us here. Okay, again, there's a drop in restrictiveness, but that's compensated by a rather large increase in completeness. And that's the case from any of these starting points, right? Once we add in gamma, we're getting these big improvements in completeness. So the takeaway here then is that not all parameters in these models are equally effective. Adding eta or zeta leads to a large drop in restrictiveness in return for only a small gain in completeness. On the other hand, it looks like this other probability weighting parameter in CPT uh, plays an actual important role in capturing real risk preferences. All right, so things I'm completely skipping in this talk. So first, uh, we have a, a whole second application to predicting initial play in games. So there we measure the restrictiveness and completeness of three different models. Okay, second, um, we provide in the paper estimators, uh, both for restrictiveness and for completeness, and characterizations of their asymptotic distributions, which allows us to compute confidence intervals. So this is something I also glossed over. You might have noticed these funny whiskers, right, on each of these dots. So these are in fact 95% confidence intervals for estimates of completeness and restrictiveness. All right, then finally to conclude, when a theory fits the data well, it matters whether that's because the theory is really capturing important regularities in the data uh, versus whether that's because the theory is so flexible, it actually can explain any behavior at all. Okay, so we provide in this paper a practical algorithmic approach for evaluating the restrictiveness of a theory. Uh, we've applied it to two domains uh, and that's uncovered new insights about the models themselves and the roles of the parameters within those models. And the last thing that I'll, I'll emphasize is that the method is really not special to any of those domains. So it's certainly not relying on anything about certainty equivalence or games. Uh, so we're actually already uh, sort of exploring application of this technique to other domains and uh, it would be exciting to see it apply to domains that we haven't even thought about. <laughs>